Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this research webinar. My name is Messias Alfius. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science here at Stellenbosch University. Additionally, I serve as a manager for the Quantitative Finance Research Program at the National Institute for Theoretical and Computational Sciences, which is abbreviated as NITEC. And I'm also honored to be the South Africa Not Leader for the Inspired Center for Responsible Sciences. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome Professor Robert Pfaff from the University of Bond in Australia. Professor Pfaff is a founder for the Teaching Research Framework, a methodology that is designed to enhance communication of research idea within academic circle. He also served as an editor-in-chief for the Pacific Basin Finance Journal and Putable Finance Journal in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the world. Um, furthermore, Professor Faf organized an annual inspired global pitching competition, and I had the privilege of participating this competition last year, and I made it to a semi-final pool. And this year, I'm honored to be the South African, uh, South African coordinator for this competition. Professor Faf will provide further insight into this uh, competition during his presentation. Please join me to extend my warm welcome to Professor Faf as he's going to share to us his research expertise on how to actually pitch research in a responsible science manner. Professor Faf, thank you very much for, for your time and for being generous with, uh, with us. Thank you. Over to you, you have one hour. Thank you very much, Pezius. Uh, very kind words, and it's a great pleasure and honour for me to join you online to, to share with you uh, something that's become an obsession, uh, a good obsession, but a passion for sure. Um, Mezius, uh, you've been such a wonderful collaborator. We've, we've uh, only met uh, less than 12 months ago, and already I, I feel like we're very good friends and uh, very close collaborators. Today, it's an online presentation, but I hope uh, circumstances will allow that next year in 2025, I can uh, be there with you in person. Uh, that would be fantastic, but we can talk about that um, and continue that conversation offline. So I'm, I'm really going to talk to you for the next uh, hour or so on two closely related topics, and I've got a large body of slides here that I'm making available to Mesius to circulate um, as widely as possible. And, and there's many more slides than I'll cover today, but as I was telling him uh, before we started, I like to jam pack the slides so that those of you that are interested later on and you have access to the slides, you'll find uh, there a lot of things that are very interesting, uh, a lot of uh, things that will be of great value to you. There's many links in these slides and so it's a gift from me to you. So we won't go through every slide. We just don't have enough time today. But this combines uh, the two topics, pitching research and responsible science. And so I have blended those in, in this title of pitching responsible science. So in the uh, next little while, uh, my agenda will cover three related Areas. I'm going to give you a quick primer on what I believe uh, responsible science means. Then uh, we'll move to a quick primer on the pitching research framework. And then the final part, uh, there's uh, much I can tell you about resources, initiatives and opportunities. And Mesias has already given you a bit of a flavour of what uh, I can tell you. And that's mostly when we will have many slides for you to explore later offline, uh, but I'll give you a flavour of that. <clears throat> so responsible science, well, what do we mean by science? Why am I using the term science? You might think, uh, aren't we going to learn about research and, and how does that relate to science? Well, in fact, for the, for, for the simple situation, or, or for simplicity, let me say, Let's assume, and I think this is a reasonable assumption, 
that science and research are basically one and the same thing. And they're tied together very closely to knowledge. So as, as humans and, uh, you know, the human species, we have a very special place in the world. And one thing that really has been a driver for prosperity and, and just being human is the thirst for knowledge and the thirst for new knowledge. And that's why research and science is so important to us, particularly at universities, but uh, throughout society. So let's think about science, let's think about research. And even if we, you know, we, you don't see yourself as a, a, uh, a lab coat scientist, we're not in medicine, we're not, uh, we're not saving lives directly, or maybe even indirectly, but we are scientists. We should strive and, and have an ambition to be scientists. For many or most of us uh, listening and watching, we will come under the banner of social science, scientists and social science, and that, that's just fine. So the research that we're thinking about here, not only tied to knowledge, another way of describing it is we are interested very much in scholarly research. So the three pillars that make up responsible science uh, are shown on this slide. Credible research, relevant research, independent research. So by credible research, what I have in mind is that it is research that we can rely upon. It, it's done rigorously, it's done to a high quality standard, and it's reliable in what it delivers. It tells us something, it should tell us something reliable about how the world works, about how the world works, within the discipline that we've chosen. That's credible research. And that's where we normally very much keep ourselves as, as academics, as researchers. Uh, we we want to deliver real, uh, rigorous research. The second arm is one that uh, I think some of us delve into, but others sort of think, oh, no, I'll just stay. I'll stay with credible research. I'll, I'll stay very much focused with the academic literature. But relevant research, the second pillar, is about challenging ourselves to choose research topics that have a closer link to real world problems. So relevant or useful research is something that we should strive for. And it, it's not always possible. We still definitely need a, a big pipeline of research that is pure research, that is very academic in its nature, and one or more steps removed from reality. But, uh, modern times, 21st century focus uh, requires us to sit back and think a little bit more than we used to about are we choosing topics that are relevant and useful around real world problems. The third pillar is independent research. And by independent research, what we're really after here is being objective, being able to deliver in some sense uh, unbiased research, okay, unbiased observations and knowledge or, or, or um, well, unbiased knowledge. And, and so when we bring these three together, to me, this defines what, well, in my view is uh, reflected in the term responsible science. So to, to keep, you know, to, to keep us the, the simple flavour of this, and trust me, we could talk about this for a long, long time. I'm just scratching the surface for you. We have credible research. Think of that as re relating to reliable knowledge. Relevant research, mostly related to useful knowledge, and independent research, mostly about unbiased knowledge. Now, these three dimensions are not mutually exclusive, but for simplicity, simplicity today, I'm putting it to you in terms of these three uh, ideas. Now, why are we interested in this? Well, there's many ways and many things we could talk about, and I'll only touch the surface on the one that's mentioned in this slide, and that is a, a view that maybe all is not well with the research process and, and the research we have. And, and uh, using the word crisis needs to be cautioned. I think these days, Crisis is, is an overused word and has lost a lot of its meaning. And uh, I should have really put crisis in inverted commas here 
but I am reflecting at least one pocket of views around those that have thought about this quite a bit that maybe it's heading in the direction or in the realm in, in some circumstances, in some disciplines at various times around crisis. And, and there are three things I can point you to that people have identified as being related to or manifesting what this, this research um, crisis, let's say, is about. The first is the temptation, particularly for novice researchers, to engage in what are euphemistically called questionable research practices. And two uh, examples of this are um, hypothesizing after the results are known, which is uh, has the acronym HARKING, H-A-R-K, uh, or the um, rigorous, uh, you know, the, the, the data mining of research in a way that you're searching um, searching for a result. Uh, others have also pointed to replication fails and publication bias. So there's been a growing amount of evidence that some of the, the research, even in the best journals and the iconic papers, uh, failed to come through rigorously with replication or repro reproduction of the results. And so this is a concern because uh, how reliable is that research if we don't feel or we have a question that it may not be possible uh, to uh, replicate it. And just going back to the questionable research practices, um, the second uh, example that I was thinking of was p-hacking, where uh, researchers are tempted because they, they know that journals want to publish statistically significant findings, they manipulate the data and or the analysis and keep doing and redoing the analysis until they find that uh, statistically significant result. But clearly this is, you know, at a minimum a questionable research practice. And indeed, if it's done systematically, it's something that we would be very concerned about because again, it's undermining the reliability of those results. If uh, it takes someone, you know, many thousands, many hundreds of thousands of regressions to come up with a set of results that actually support uh, the hypothesis. And the third thing that's mentioned on this slide is uh, the, the notion of uh, a publication, a potential publication bias in journals. If journals are very focused on, as they traditionally are in many dis disciplines, of only valuing statistically significant results, then we don't see very often null results or negative findings. And so if you just you know think about it for a second, uh, the extent to which you've read academic literature and ask yourself, when was the last time you read a paper that presented no findings, zero statistical significance? It's very rare. And that to me, seems very strange and one that would make us wonder, well, how reliable is it uh, that we should re um, rely on uh, the journal literature when there may well be this positive publication bias? So, you know, a crisis, what crisis? To what extent is science credible, relevant and independent? To what extent is research reliable, useful, and unbiased? Those are the questions that I pose to you. Well, what are the solutions? The solutions aren't easy. There's a there's a big push in the last years and, and probably decade or more that we embrace open science. Uh, and this has many, many facets, um, but open science does open the door for potential solutions, but there's no golden or silver, no golden solution, no silver bullet, because um, sadly, a, a minority of uh, behavior in the, um, the scientific field can undermine all good intentions. But open science to me seems to be uh, a, a highly um, positive direction where we may see uh, improvements um, in, in, in uh, the reliability of, of science. And one example of open science is pre-registered research 
as Mezzi has mentioned, I'm the editor-in-chief of Pacific Basin Finance Journal. And for the last year or so, we have, uh, in fact, since 2019, we've been publishing replications, which we've been doing in a pre-registered way. And we've opened this up last year in 2023 to uh, being interested and open the door for researchers to put forward detailed pre-analysis plans. So before you've seen the data, before you've done any analysis, share with us your ideas. And if uh, after review, this seems all very positive, then it can lead to a publication. In fact, the PVFJ, two publications, a report before the analysis and a study that executes the report, so uh, with analysis. Much more can be said on responsible science. I have to leave it there due to time constraints today. Um, there's many good sources of information. Here's a shameless plug for one, uh, well, one paper and one video. Um, shameless because these are outputs that, that I've produced. So there's much more detail in the paper uh, about uh, the responsible science matters issue. And the video is a more detailed dive into this. So uh, I, if, you, if you find this interesting, I urge you to access one or either or both of these resources. Let me move on to goal two. The goal two is now uh, changing tack a little bit, but it will be related to responsible science. And hopefully I'll remember to, to bring these together um, down, down the track shortly. So the pitching research framework is a framework that I developed uh, well over my career, really, but it came uh, to a tangible form uh, with the very first uh, upload to the SSRN in 2014 of the Pitching Research Working Paper. It's now almost 10 years down the track. Uh, it's had in excess of 26,000 uh, downloads, which ranks it at around 170 of all-time downloads on the SSRN. I'm very pleased and excited to tell you just a couple of days ago, I uploaded version 19. So uh, version 19 is now available and uh, it, it basically captures uh, all the links and all the information in, in a, a, as brief a way as I possibly could so that it, it's designed as a very important and critical reference for you. And so this is my gift to you. And because it's a new version, version 19, it's a great timing and a great gift. I really urge all of you to access that paper, get your own individual version, download it. There's a lot of information there and a lot of detail and um, explanation and then links to where you can dig deeper, deeper, deeper. So today, it's just a very brief chat about this pitching research framework. and. And one way of sort of thinking about what the framework is doing is trying to resolve or solve or help solve a really difficult problem of communication. And communication for us um, in all our walks of life, not just at work, at home, wherever we are, communication is challenging. It's, it's so difficult to convey what are the essential elements of what's troubling you, what, what, what you uh, want to talk about. And when it comes to academic work, it's doubly, triply difficult, it, particularly when you're starting out because there's a new language and there's a lot of daunting information and you're overwhelmed with information. So the, the pitching research framework is designed to help you with this challenge. And the communication challenge is, to an academic expert. Now, this is super difficult, but the pitching research framework, I, I really honestly and genuinely believe can make that difficult task much easier, but not necessarily easy. So here's the framework. Uh, no doubt many of you have seen this before, some of you won't. Um, it is deceptively simple. Uh, you, you're challenged to use about 1,000 words to give answers to all these spaces. So there's 11 items. 
And I'll just quickly read down these 11 items on the left-hand side. The working title, basic research question, key papers, motivation. These are the first four. These are the what I call the big picture anchors. These are where largely you are trying to frame your research to give the context that will allow that communication to start in a very positive way, in a very clear way. So those four items are the big picture anchors. And it's sort of like hovering a little bit above the research that you want to do. The next three are the essential building blocks, the idea, the data, and the tools. This is the core, the heart, the engine room of your research. It's mostly about how you're going to execute your research. The next two items, what's new and so what, are two key questions you need to pose to yourself. So we don't want to discover, but we want to create knowledge. We want to create new knowledge. That's what research and science is about. So the what's new question is directly aimed at that. What is new? What is novel about the research you want to do? But that's not the end of the story. There's so many things that are new and novel. Let me suggest to you, and this is not literally true, but there's a limitless list of new and novel things. So just by you thinking, oh, I've identified something new and novel, do you, should you think your job is done? It's not done because there is too many of these and many of them are trivial and not worth doing. That brings in question, the second question, so what? So why is it important? Who cares? And particularly who cares academically, but also for those topics, particularly that are trying to solve or get close to real world problems, then who cares in the real world? So these two key questions are another way of looking at your research to figure out whether it's worthwhile and how worthwhile it is to, to embark on the research. The, the penultimate item is contribution. This is the, the, um, the thing that keeps everyone up at night, even the most experienced and, and seasoned researcher. Not just identifying what your contribution is, contribution to the literature and to knowledge, but being able to articulate it. So it's one thing having a belief that there is a contribution but the added challenge is being able to articulate that and write about it in a way you can communicate it to others. Other considerations is the final item, and this is just a catch-all. It's basically saying, well, you, you, you've looked at the 10 items above. Is there something that's missing, something that could, in this context, be worthwhile sharing that um, hasn't been covered in the first 10 items? Well, let me uh, warn you that this is not a form-filling exercise, all right? So it's, a, you know, tongue-in-cheek, a spoiler alert. If you view the pitching research framework, the PRF, as simply a task of filling in a form, well, you've already failed. Sorry, you've already failed. Let me go back. This slide, it looks like it's a form to fill in. There's 11 items that you have to fill in. Well, that's the wrong mental attitude. There's a few other things I can say to warn you why this is not a form-filling exercise. Well, first thing is, who likes filling in forms? Nobody. I don't like filling in forms. I hate, I detest filling in forms. Uh, but modern thing, you know, modern society is, there's a lot of forms we need to fill in. Now, the nature of the forms we fill in is one where the vast majority of the time, we have to insert facts. What is your name? That's a fact. You can change your name, but let's not get into that territory. Where do you live? Well, you can change where you live, but right now, put in your address. What is your nationality? These are all facts. And the thing about these facts is they are unconditionally factual. So it doesn't matter. And for most form filling exercises, it does not matter the context. You're just supplying information. You're just for supplying um, factual information is really the, the critical thing. So what about the pitching research framework? You might say, well, surely we're not allowed to make stuff up. It's got to be factual. Okay. 
I agree. But that's where I finish agreeing because the thing about the facts that you bring to this task is that they are all conditional. They're all conditional on each other. They're all conditional on where you are in your thought process and your development and thinking around your research project. And as you evolve, as you become more experienced, as you understand things better, as you develop skills, as you just think about it for more, uh, you know, a longer period of time, things change. Things change in a way that old facts need to be replaced by new facts. And this is a positive sign. So you iterate towards a better version of your pitch, of the PRF template. So it is not a fact-filling exercise. It is about being creative and productive and serious in terms of a positive mindset towards developing and planning your research, your future research. So you've got a thousand words, and you know uh, my view is plus or minus twenty percent, down to eight hundred, up to twelve hundred is still okay. If you get way below eight hundred, I get nervous. It's sort of like you, you, you're losing some um, some opportunity here. You know, you you can't ask the receiver to mind read. So you need to put in relevant information. Below 800 words, you, you, you're, you're losing an opportunity. Above 1,200 and way above 1,200, you fall for the trap of information overload or information's probably the wrong term because what I've found is it's just, it, it can be a brain dump. And uh, so, so what we're trying to avoid here is overwhelming or drowning someone, an expert in the field, with so many words that they just go, well, I don't, I, I can't make, I can't make this out. The five golden rules. So how should you, you know, what, what generally should you think about when you, you, you're working on your thousand words? Well, be clear, focus to the point. Don't think uh, there's anything controversial there. Try and be as meaningful as you possibly can. So another way of thinking what that's about is avoid superficiality, avoid um, motherhood statements. So you need to be as specific as you can and as, as informative as you can. And if you do that, it's very likely it'll be clear you've put in an effort. So the golden rule number three is that it is effort based. The fourth one is that it's all internally connected. So you might do really well on the first three, but then have a lot of disconnect between what you're writing, between the different elements. And that's not good. So one thing that we need to do as we reflect and we iterate is sit back and see how each of the items hang together. Is there a cohesive and coherent, strong theme going through? That's what we're after. And if we do all that, golden rule number five, should be looked after. We will be successful in starting a conversation. It will be a communication, a productive and positive communication with our the receiver, the pitchee. It doesn't mean it'll be perfect. In fact, get that out of your mind. If you think, oh, wow, I really like this. I'm going to aim for, for, for perfection. Well, it's a mirage. Perfection does not exist partly and mostly probably because of what I was saying a few minutes ago, that you're iterating your ideas. So what seems perfect five minutes ago, an hour ago, two weeks ago, no longer will be perfect because your, your ideas are evolving. So do aim to do the best you can in the time you have available. And if you start a conversation, even if the receiver asks a lot of questions, and they don't agree with everything, they're going to be able to give you good advice and feedback, and that is success. That is the success that we are after here. So as one of my students uh, said um, a few years back, they said, well, the pitching research, PRF is designed to allow a research-enabled uh, learner of any level in virtually any academic discipline 
to identify the core elements of a viable and worthwhile empirical project. In fact, I've got that wrong. I thought I had a different slide, but they're my words. Um, and a more succinct version of that is it's about connecting emerging scholars with research mentors. So here's where we're going to tie in uh, the pitching research framework with responsible science. And it's only one way, and it, it's quite um, shallow, but hopefully you will take it for the positive intent that um, I have in mind. My argument and view is, well, the pitching research framework is a, an ideal enabling tool for achieving responsible science. So if you use it in the way that's intended, then uh, you can well be on the pathway to achieving research that is reliable, that is uh, useful, and that is uh, objective. So in the next set of slides, there's, there's uh, 11 pairs of slides coming up. And uh, given time, I'm pretty sure we won't get through all of them, but we'll get through a few. You'll, you'll see how I'm using these. And then when you access these slides later on, you can work through the information yourselves, or at least I'd recommend you do that, because the pair of uh, slides, first of all, makes a brief statement about the PRF item. So currently, uh, we, so we're just going to go down the list. We're at item A, the working title. Um, the second slide will then give you three quick tips, okay, three quick tips on how to take on the challenge of addressing that particular item. So uh, let, let's begin. So the working title, uh, Bill Chat in 2021 described the title, working title, as the highway billboard of your article. And Clemens in 2018 described it as your shop front. If it doesn't appeal to your reader, then they won't read further. So it makes sense. You're trying to signal in a very efficient way a very informative way, but an engaging way, what your research is about. But not every single aspect. So one big mistake I've seen is titles that go on for line after line after line because the, the, the creator of the title feels like they have to tell the reader in the title the seven different things that are important in their paper. And that's just too much. It, there's too many moving parts. My advice is just aim for three, the three most salient. So what are the three uh, quick tips? So the working title should, well, first quick tip, be meaningful, succinct and engaging. Uh, I don't think there's anything controversial there. Second quick tip, it should have three key aspects, all right? So, so, so set yourself the task. In your project, your prospective project, what are the three most salient, most important, most signaling aspects of your research that you want to convey to your reader? And the th third quick tip is that the working title should use appropriate language and concepts to signal key, the key nature of the project that links to the desired scholarly discipline. So if you use language that is a little strange to the scholarly community you're trying to engage with, you're going to confuse them. They're going to go, what's this about? Is this, is this designed for me? Okay, research question. Uh, is the basic focus or topic area that limits what broad concern is at the heart of your proposed research? So what is at the heart? And it's delimiting that. The research question defines the broad intellectual domain in which the research project resides. So the research question identifies the core scientific problem for which a clear answer or solutions remains elusive, okay? It's the heart, it's the problem, it's where the answer or solutions are elusive. Three quick tips for the research question. Well, a research question should not be long-winded and overly complicated. And I would advise just making it focused on one thing, uh, try and avoid the temptation of my main research question is X and 
the sub questions are x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 people lose interest they'll fall asleep so make it short to the point and engaging second quick tip the research questions should make clear sense using neutral language so what i mean by this is you may well have a hypothesis in mind now the hypothesis is not neutral it will be giving a prediction so the research question should just convey what are the key things at task with your research and express it neutrally and the third quick tip is that the research question should be meaningful so avoid triviality and and uh, a typical example of a trivial research question is one that you pose where it's, it seems very likely the answer is a yes or a no. It's binary. Okay. So challenge yourself, you know, to, to pivot the, such a question in a way that is exploring more deeply the research topic that is about, well, why or how, not just if. The key papers. The key papers are a small set of papers that in a meaningful sense collectively represent, collectively represent the broad literature, the key, the critical elements of the broad literature. The key papers are those scholarly research works that are most salient, they're most critical, and then the most important foundations for your proposed project. You might say, well, according to who? Most salient, critical, important. Um, according to you. It's according to your reading of the literature. Because one thing is that you have to own your research and you have to go down the pathway of your ambition is to be the expert. You might not start out to be the expert, but you want to be the expert. And so at a very early stage, you've got to figure out and have a stab at, and you may not get it perfect, you may get some things wrong, but what are these most critical, salient, and important foundations? Three quick tips. The key papers should, well, first quick tip, be those papers that most critically impact or guide your intellectual research plans. I think that's just reinforcing what I've just said. Second quick tip, they should persuasively and collectively capture frontier knowledge in this field. So think about that as a really important goal, frontier knowledge. So frontier knowledge most likely won't be captured by seminal papers in the field. If you're studying in a field, uh, let's say agency theory in finance or, or, or accounting and finance, Jensen and Meckley, 1976, okay? That's almost a 50-year-old iconic and seminal paper. I would not choose it as a key paper. It's seminal. Of course it's seminal if you're doing something on agency theory. But it's by nominating it, you are ignoring almost 50 years of literature that will build on Jensen and Netley, Meckley and represent the frontier knowledge. So you need to get confident on what the frontier knowledge is, and you need to be able to confidently convey and communicate that to an expert in the field. So the third quick tip really then uh, brings this around to uh, some, some, I guess, um, pretty um, challenging advice, or at least confronting advice, that the key papers should not be too old not be written by unknowns and not be published in weak journals. Now, I've stated that as almost immutable rules. Now, of course, the, the rules are made to be broken, but I think to make it as stark as this and say, choose recent papers, choose papers written by gurus or leaders in the field, choose papers that are published in the tier one or leading journals. If you have that as your uppermost thinking, you're much more likely to get closer to that frontier of knowledge. Motivation. Motivation is a general intellectual stimulus underlying your chosen research topic. It should center on the research question and it should frame your research from a broader perspective to clarify why you have chosen this as your research question. 
Here are three quick tips for the motivation. Motivation should convey a brief, relevant appreciation of three things. What is currently known? What is currently unknown? And what do we need to know? So if you can, if you can nail that at a big picture level, I'm pretty confident you're going to have a great motivation. Second quick tip. Motivation should adopt a big picture perspective that frames your proposed research. I've stressed this a couple of times, but what I see happening a lot is when students and, uh, well, researchers generally, early career researchers, start thinking about and writing up their motivation, they think too narrowly. They just think, oh, well, my paper's about blah, blah, blah. and and, you know, it's going to be clear to the reader, and in this case, to the pitchee, the receiver of your pitch, of what it is you plan to do in the later items of the pitch. What you're trying to do now is give that big picture perspective, that context. It's really, really important. The sec a third uh, quick tip on motivation. The motivation might involve helping to resolve a meaningful intellectual puzzle. And one of my favorites, it's an abstract example, a puzzle about a disconnect between the real world and academic theory. All right, well, keeping an eye on the time, we're um, about 40 minutes from the beginning of uh, when I started this, uh, this uh, webinar. So I, I'll, I'll very shortly leave these and go to goal three, but let me, uh, um, just plow on a little bit further. So idea, uh, item E of the pitching research framework. The idea is the first of the basic building blocks that captures that the essence of what it is that you plan to do. The idea is the core intellectual notion that lies at the very heart of your proposed research study, the essential connected concepts or propositions that drive the scholarly content of your chosen research topic. Quick tips, avoid being unclear, avoid rambling, avoid needlessly complicated ideas. Second quick tip, ideas should be inherently connected with a research question. So, you know, if you've, you've stated the research question, you know, uh, and you've written it, and then you start writing about the idea, go back and have a look at the research question. You would be surprised how quickly you can see and, and someone that's not you, so someone you trust, uh, one of your colleagues, someone uh, that can understand your research will say, hey, how's this idea linked to your research question? And the third quick tip, tip is that the idea should be founded as much as it possibly can on robust, relevant theory. Theory is important and uh, the, the, the most valuable research, the most reliable research, the most impactful research will have a very solid theoretical structure. And so the idea should reflect that very briefly and succinctly. So for those that it, this is appropriate and, and it's, it's more likely for quantitative and almost unlikely for qualitative research, think about a hypothesis or a prediction that will be very reflective of uh, and helpful for conveying what your idea is about. Data is a second of the basic building blocks that constitutes observations of relevant phenomena upon which empirical evidence can be created. Data can either be quantitative, measured and captured numerically, of course, or qualitative. Three quick tips. Should be fit for purpose. Second quick tip is that the data should involve a sample size and data quality that's acceptable and comparable for this field, and it should be sufficiently representative. And the third quick tip is understand what the gold standard is for data and strive to get as close to that gold standard as you possibly can. Tools is a third basic building block uh, that includes techniques, hardware, software, models, or any other necessary resource or device for executing the required analysis. The tools briefly describe the essential elements of the research method that you plan to use. Quick tip number one, tools should be fit for purpose. Quick tip number two, you should have legal access 
and the appropriate skills and training for all the tools that you need. And the third quick tip uh, for tools, just like the third quick tip for data, be aware of the gold standard and strive to emulate as closely as you can that gold standard for the tools. I'm going to skip over the rest of uh, these pairs of, of slides. So there's one here about what's new. There's quick tips. There's one here for so what. There's quick tips. There's one here for contribution. There's quick tips. There's one here for other considerations. There's quick tips. For a detailed explanation, as I've already urged and stressed and, and, uh, and excitedly so, the latest version 19 is just out of pitching research. It's brimming. It, it's a reference point. It's an iconic reference point and brimming with all that you need to know, many, many links, many URL for um, many papers, many videos. It is a must and I urge you to access it. In the remaining 15 minutes or so, I want to tell you about the resources, initiatives and opportunities that come out of responsible science, come out of the pitching research framework and indeed come naturally out of the combination of the two. So many more slides than I can cover in this talk. As I said, there's a lot of gifts here for you offline, so I urge you to explore it. But in these slides, um, I talk about drilling down in more detail into the pitching research framework. I tell you about an immersive website that we've developed. I tell you about more about the Inspires Research Network that Mesias mentioned at the beginning of the, today's webinar. I talk about self-contained and self-paced micro-credential course. That is a great gift to you for your research training. I talk about uh, the Inspires Global Pitching Research Competitions that Mesias also mentioned. And then in the end, I bring this all together in terms of the Inspires Centre for Responsible Science. And as Mesias mentioned, he is a key member and node leader uh, in Africa and in South Africa for the Inspires Centre for Responsible Science. This slide has uh, URLs for detailed papers on each item. Each of the 11 PRF items, I've now managed to find time to write detailed advice, detailed descriptions. So if, if ever you get stuck, if ever there's a hurdle or a blockage, and, and, and you say, oh, it's one of these items, then you can easily access for free from the SSRN. Uh, and in the right-hand column are the URL addresses. The one-stop shop for, the, for all things pitching is the pitchingresearch.com website. Uh, it's very easy to find. Here is a screenshot of the website. So this is what you would encounter. So. Uh, the very nice um, message there, your research journey starts here. So there's lots of information, lots of valuable resources here. Let me draw your attention across the top because across the top of this screenshot um, are the, the different tabs, the different sections within the website for where you can find great resources, great information, great value. The Inspires Network has a uh, tab. The Inspires Centre for Responsible Science has a tab. We have a tab for events and co uh, competitions. We have a resources tab. We have a news tab. This news tab is, is a uh, recent enhancement where we're now uh, trying to systematically and regularly put news items that members of Inspires, and indeed anyone, but we're particularly thinking of members of Inspires, to go and get updates. And then in the far right-hand corner, you'll see in red the start pitching um, symbol. And we're developing and, and continue to develop a, uh, an app, a web-based app, which uh, we use the acronym GOFA. G stands for guidance, F stands for feedback, and A for assessment. So what uh, we, we're planning to do uh, later this year, I hope, is launch a beta version of this where not only you get guidance as you complete 
your pitch online, but it will give a facility for getting feedback on your pitch. And then in those circumstances, and particularly for course leaders, um, they might be interested in, or, or whether you're running a competition, is assessing those pitches. So there's an assessment phase. So that's, um, that's work in progress. So if you click the resources tab, this is a, I guess, a magnified version of what you would see. Uh, there are seven modules that um, st are standalone and available that involve readings, videos, PowerPoint slides for each of these topics. So the responsible science matters topic, module one, um, that you, you can uh, access information there about this one. Pitching Research Matters Module 2 uh, is there, but it, it's really been superseded by the micro-credential course uh, that I'm going to tell you about shortly, but um, you, you can certainly access that material. And then various other modules are available there as well. All right, let me pivot now to tell you a little bit more about the INSPIRES Network. In, INSPIRES stands for the International Society of Pitching Research for Responsible Science, and hopefully you can see how these come together in terms of today's webinar. I talked to you about responsible science, I talked to you about pitching research, and I stressed how I view the pitching research tool and framework as an ideal platform and an ideal way of moving in the direction of responsible science. Now, the Inspires Network is a globally facing research network primarily aimed at research training and capacity building resting on foundation theme of responsible science. No surprises there. You should treat today's webinar as another installment, a gift from Inspires to you. So this is one of the, the key activities of Inspires, getting reaching out to well, from my perspective anyway, anyway, the farthest reaches of, of the globe to places where it might be more difficult to, to get this training and to have capacity building and to be, you know, trained about, well, responsible science is important. So Inspires is, is a, a great research network. We have over 1,150 members. The um, URL is uh, on this slide near the top there and we have 81 jurisdictions covered now members from 81 jurisdictions most of these uh, are countries some of these are uh, um, uh, well regions or, or jurisdictions but 81 so I'm very proud of that and uh, strange sort of goal I have is that um, one day soon we uh, we will reach 100 jurisdictions I know for a fact there are many countries in Africa, and Africa is one of our main targets uh, where we do not have members yet. So if we can get members in many of these countries in Africa, we will get close to uh, getting over the uh, century of jurisdictions. Now here's an unsolicited email that I received. It's a, it's a coincidence. It came in yesterday. It was in response to launching or uploading version 19 of the pitching research uh, paper on the SSRN, and I'd circulated it, uh, information about it to the Inspires Network, just to say, hey, we got a new version and I'm really proud of it, and uh, to, to really promote it. And Elizabeth Zhu, and she's uh, kindly given permission for me to, uh, to, to reveal her identity from the University of Queensland, replied back to me yesterday, she said, the extensive influence and reach of Inspires are truly remarkable. I wanted to share a brief message expressing how many individuals, including myself, are deriving great benefit from it, wishing you continued success. So please forgive me for sharing this with you. I was so pleased to receive this. This is the sort of thing that lifts my day. It'll lift my week and it makes this all worthwhile. Um, when I receive these messages, um, it, it's truly wonderful. And, and I thank Elizabeth for uh, doing that. So Inspires needs you, but you need Inspires. How can you join up? Well, mostly, and um, for most of you, uh, the first Google Docs link will work. 
It takes about five minutes. We just need some information. It's critical to get your email address because we need to update you. Um, and we, we don't hound you, we don't harass you, but we email uh, occasionally during the year just to say, hey, there's new news. We're launching a new initiative. We're running a new pitching competition. So um, it, it's, um, uh, it, 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 it's required for that purpose. In some jurisdictions and locations, Google is problematic. And so there's a second link there. So when you get these slides, and indeed you can uh, get this link from the website I mentioned earlier, but if you have these slides in front of you, you can click that link and uh, one of those links and sign up. And I strongly urge you to sign up. All the resources I'm talking to you about are free. You don't have to be a member. But what I plead and beg you is, well, if you're benefiting from these and from the generosity of, well, not just me, but you know, we, we're growing a, a strong world and global team where there's generous donation, really, uh, philanthropic time that's being given to this cause, then it's only a small thing to ask, voluntarily sign up. Um, that, that allows us to see the penetration that we've got and in, in future, if we decide to put in application for funding and grants, we can point to uh, a tangible tangible evidence of the penetration and the membership. So um, that's just a, a little request for you uh, if you uh, would sign up, if you see value, and hopefully you do see value. I made quick reference earlier to a micro-credential course, and this really subs... Um, um, to, makes uh, redundant, I guess, or to some extent, the module two that I was talking about, pitching research uh, on the website. So this is a micro-credential course, it's official course of Bond University. I think uh, extremely, uh, you know, very much, I think, uh, Bond University for making this, well, allow me to create this course for them and making it free. It's absolutely free. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, if you click on this URL, it will take you to a web page where you can find out all the information you need, including if you were to scroll down, this is a screenshot, if you were to scroll down to the bottom, you uh, would very quickly find out how to sign up and then complete the course. And there's, there's, there's some value in doing this. You will benefit from research training, your, your skills, and your ability to think of how to use the pitching research framework will improve. Moreover, if you complete the course and complete the final quiz, and the final quiz has 20 multiple choice questions, if you get 14 or more correct, 70% or better, you're deemed to have successfully completed the course, you can redo the final quiz. Most people don't need to redo the final quiz. You then qualify for an official Bond University certificate. This records your success, this records your effort, and this records the training that you've received by doing the Pitching Research Matters course. So I would urge you to seriously consider um, signing up for that course, doing the course, and getting that certification. It takes five to 10 hours. Um, there are three modules. It's aimed at research-enabled um, students, I guess, but if you're a PhD student, you're research-focused, you're above that. If you're an early career researcher, you're above that yet again. Three modules, 19 lessons. There are bonus slides at the end in case you hit some stumbling blocks. I, I have been told it's, it's not entirely straightforward or easy to sign up. Please persevere. I think it's worthwhile. The bonus slides at the back uh, might be able to help you out of a spot. But if you are having trouble, um, you can send me an email. So the Inspires Global Pitching Research Competitions, Ms. just mentioned these. Uh, there's the URL for these. We're in, uh, we've now launched our third edition. We had a 2022 edition, 300 entries, six grand finalists. The winner was from Vietnam. 2023 edition, 200 entries, grand final. Uh, was well, it turned out to be in, in January this year, and the winner received 5,000 Australian dollars. There's a similar first prize 
this year, 5,000 Australian dollars, plus other prizes. So the IGPRC is currently in, in process, in progress, and the grand final we're aiming for December 2024. I don't think I need to complicate this too much, but there's, uh, there's country coordinated national um, events as well as um, the rest of the world feeding into a semi-final pool, which is then distilled into a grand final. For more information, there's an SSRRM paper. The URL is here. And there's a 16-minute short information video if you're interested in engaging in, uh, and, and you're um, qualified to engage in this year's IGPRC. Final thing I'll mention in, in about a minute or so that sort of wraps this all up and, and we, we complete the circle and, and I'm really pleased to share this with you is um, we have now a virtual centre, the Inspire Centre for Responsible Science, the ICARS, let's call it, is the acronym and the URLs uh, there. This is a screenshot of what you would um, see if you click that, um, that link. And if you scroll down that link, you would see that we currently have 74 node leaders around the world. So uh, quite a few in Africa. It's not the most um, populous, uh, naturally, but me being Australian, there's uh, many node leaders in Australia and New Zealand. We have many in Asia, many in Europe. North and South America are a bit sparse, but there are, I'm pleased to say, 10 current node leaders, and I'm looking to grow the node leadership um, uh, significantly more, particularly, well, anywhere really, but particularly into countries uh, that we currently have no representation. And I'm very pleased and proud to draw your attention to number five on the list, which is Mesius, um, representing South Africa, the node leader, but uh, of course, more locally, uh, representing Stellenbosch. So, I might use that as my way of concluding the webinar, thanking, um, web, uh, thanking Mesias for being uh, such a great supporter of everything that I do, including uh, ICARS, including uh, the Inspire Centre for Responsible Science. This uh, webinar is a manifestation, one of the deliverables, as along with many others, including all the resources I've told you about and the inspires global pitching research competition. All of these are initiatives and, and, and offerings free to the community, to the research community, particularly in those far-flung and remote regions and areas where it's really difficult. You don't have a critical mass of research. You don't have a lot of research guidance. You don't have a lot of resources. Inspires and Inspires Centre for Responsible Science has as its goal to improve uh, the situation, research training, capacity building uh, for a long time to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I've enjoyed the session. I hope you found it helpful and useful. And uh, I think um, we have now time for some uh, questions. So I'll hand it back to Mesias and I'll try and figure out how to stop sharing. Thank you very much, Prof. Robert Fab, for such a great uh, webinar. And I, I personally, I really enjoyed it, and it was really ben it benefited me as a, as a researcher. And I hope it also benefit a lot of uh, some of our those who joined this webinar. Um, any question to Robert online? Okay, Valen, or Miriam. Okay, um, thank you, Prof. Mine is not a question, but it's just um, to say thank you. I think last year I was also part of the those, um, I, I think I ended up going to Q1 or quarterfinals somewhere there. And um, from, my, from my experience using it, uh, I also, You've also adopted uh, it. I'm using it to teach research methodologies at uh, Water Sisulu University, where I'm based. And uh, it is simplifying research. You know, research sometimes is a complicated thing. 
for most students, but with that uh, template, um, it is simplifying a lot of things. So mine is not just a, it's not a question, but it's just to say thank you and uh, keep um, on sharing with us that information because it is transforming lives. And I wish to keep using the same template. Um, so the more you also do this, I, I, I see you said you have now the 2024, I'm going to read it and allow it to, I will then use to as a means of cross-pollination of ideas to other, to other students. Thank you. William, uh, excellent. Uh, lovely to uh, hear your voice and uh, thank you so much for, for joining in on this. I know uh, quite a bit of this uh, you'll be well aware of, but, um, I, you know, along with Mesius and, and yourself and others that I've already met, well, virtually, I've met Mesius. I had the, the pleasure uh, last year. We were uh, at an exotic location, a conference. Um, but I really look forward to continuing to collaborate with you, William, and, 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 and all the others, uh, and, and particularly and hopefully um, maybe next year if uh, I can manage to get to Africa. I don't think it's, it's such a, a, big, a big jump that uh, I can uh, warmly embrace everyone um, in, a, in an appropriate way, of course, uh, in person. Um, that, that, that will be fantastic. And I think in, in that context, we can continue to have these conversations. I can give in person and, well, I guess hybrid presentations from, from within key locations within, within Africa. I've certainly, so, so just to quickly elaborate on that in terms of my plans, apart from um, hopefully getting to South Africa, I've got very strong uh, connections and collaborations um, in Kenya. Um, so, um, with um, Mathuva, um, and I forget his first name, but uh, um, so, so what I'm hoping is if I make it all the way to Africa, I can actually go to a few different locations. Um, of course, I need to be careful about my welfare, and uh, but I think um, with appropriate uh, help and assistance and local um, local support, uh, that, that will be fantastic. Anyway, thank you, w William. Those uh, Positive comments are very, um, very much appreciated. David Mathuva, I should say. Now, th thanks, William, for entering that. I, I, I also feel the same. This pitching research framework, it simplifies in a way that someone can able to understand in a clear manner. Any other question to Robert? Especially, so like I said at the beginning, I'm in the, the Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science here in the discipline of financial risk management, and I'm the convener for the Financial Risk Management Honors Program. So I, I, I want to implement this pitching research framework to honor students because they recently received their topic from supervisor. So now they are going to sort of... Um, use this template of pitching research framework, pitch their, their research and submit it to me, probably <laughs> submit it to me in a way that I can charge. So to, because sort of now they don't have the data, they don't have anything. So I just want them to have an idea to bring this idea using this research framework, research, pitching research framework to me so that I can, uh, so it's compulsory for all the financial risk management on a student to make sure that at the end of this month, they submit this uh, pitching research framework pitch or their pitch to me. Excellent, that, that's good to hear, um, Mesius. Um, in the discussion we've had, uh, it reminds me of something that uh, um, was mentioned to me actually many years ago, uh, very early on in, in the journey. And, and um, someone said to me, you know, they said their initial reaction was what I was doing with this pitching research was making something simple complicated. But then, and I, and when he said that, and I thought, oh, you know, I felt, I felt a bit deflated. But before I had a chance to say anything, he said, but, but now I feel that it helps to make something complicated more simple. Yeah. And so. Um, so, so, so that that really lifted my spirits, and because uh, I think on the face of it, it looks like it is making complicated something simple, but I truly believe 
it's it's helping to simplify, not make really easy, but just help simplify something that is much more complicated than many yeah. of us realize. Yeah. Good. Any other question to Professor Robert Farr? A student, please feel free to, to ask, engage Professor Robert Farr, please. Any question? You, you are so also welcome. Reading. You're also Sorry. welcome to, to chat, to put on the chat. Yes, I just, just seen William's uh, comment there. We've got a wonderful program happening um, at a Walter Sisulu uh, University where we have a, a pitch mentoring um, initiative. Uh, it, I must say it, it, it's, it's challenging to, to, to uh, convince people who are very busy uh, to, to find the time to, to get into this program, but uh, William was one of the, the ones that made the effort and uh, I'm really pleased that um, he, he he's here today, and uh, I hope that you know in in, in the future we can replicate uh, the the um, work that we've done with Walter Sasulu. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, if there is no question, help me to thank Professor Robert Fat for such an excellent presentation. I hope you really enjoyed it and it will be beneficial in your career. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mezius. So stay in touch and um, yeah, uh, look forward to continuing the collaboration with you. Okay, thank you. Okay, have a good day. Bye-bye.